Hello, my name is Dr. David Rutstein. I'm delighted to uh, be here to talk about the wonderful new television show, Don't Diss My Ability. You know, that show um, speaks very credibly to the real life situations that face uh, people with disabilities and um, uh, really tries to encourage the audience to understand what disabilities are about and how people can lead normal and productive and vibrant lives. As a public health expert, you know, I used to be the Deputy Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, I understand the value of ensuring people remain healthy and vital uh, to um, what they do and the families they serve and the communities in which they live. Don't Diss My Ability uh, speaks very directly to this, and I'm delighted that this television show uh, is gaining in popularity, having a wider and wider audience, and uh, is helping people throughout the seacoast and perhaps the nation to um, better understand what it means to live with disabilities. Don't Diss My Ability is made possible through the generous support of Full Circle Community Thrift Store, helping individuals or families living with cancer. Our goal is to help alleviate the stresses of daily financial obligations during this time by providing financial assistance to those in need. Full Circle Community Thrift Store. Living Innovations, providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include Community Connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. Natural Care Wellness Center has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine seacoast for 18 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center offering gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuroemotional techniques, and massage therapy. And by One Sky Community Services. For over 30 years, One Sky has taken great pride in overcaring for those with developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders. Dedicated to every individual it serves, giving them full comprehensive support and services essential to fulfilling the personal and professional potential and becoming a successful member of their community. Serving 24 Seacoast communities, call 603-436-6111 for further information. And by TMS Architects, New England Design Redefined. Sometimes we decide who people are before we even get to know them, based on maybe what they look like, how they talk, what kind of clothes they're wearing, what kind of music they like, whatever. We decide who they are before we ever get to know who they really are inside. And it happens to us too. Sometimes people decide who we are before they know us. I think all we really want is just for, for people to see us for who we really are. Look for the best in me It's what I really am And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful Each and every day Could you take a chance Could you find a way To see me shining through in everything I do and see me beautiful 
See me beautiful, look for the best in me It's what I really am and all I want to be It may take some time, it may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful each and every day Could you take a chance? you find a way to see me shining through in everything I do and see me Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you again, my friends. Uh, and there are my friends. And I'm Ronnie Tominio, and to my right is... I'm Lee Harvey. Yeah, and over here... I'm Pamela Sollenberger. Yeah, and our guest today is Paul Belfay. Howdy. Yeah, I, I do want to <laughs> say that our, our uh, companion and friend for many years, uh, who sometimes sits here in a panel and sometimes runs a camera, uh, John Lovering is uh, getting a lot of tests in the hospital. He's going to have some heart surgery, but uh, he'll come through it. But you won't see him today in a, either capacity. But John, I know you'll see this uh, the tape version, so just wanted to mention you and hope everything went okay today. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, we. I can't remember meeting you where I met you, but I. But my great memories of you is when we used to be on radio. We. Uh, the oh. other side of town. We used to be on radio. And, right. and you would always come up uh, when, over there we had to do these fundraising. That's correct. We, That's had, to, right. we had to raise money. I don't know how that station ever survives. I, you know. And so twice a year we'd have to do this and you would come up and help us. And you were great to do that. And yeah, so, and, but you're not, you're here. I mean, we, I wanted everybody to get to know you a little bit. You. Mm -hmm. You are an actor. And I am an actor. Tell us a little bit about what you do mm. and stuff like that. I work primarily in Massachusetts. I, mm -hmm. I've worked in, in, in um, well, my earlier history is I was in radio for about 30 years. Yeah, we all think you got a great radio <laughs> voice. Yes. <laughs> okay. But I uh, also went, um, became an actor quite young, but never really was able to put everything together mm -hmm. until about uh, 10 years ago. But is it something you grew up with? You always wanted to be Yeah, some, when I was about oh. six years old. You wanted, wanted to be an actor? I wanted oh, to be somebody my. other than who I was. Oh. And even at the age of six. <laughs> and my parents said, you know what? Uh, living in Massachusetts, there's no way we're going to get you out to New York or L.A., which <laughs> was where everything was going on. So oh. <laughs> I had to put all that dream aside oh. until, you know, uh, quite a few years ago. And then wow. here I am. But I, I've worked in, in, on television shows and in, in motion pictures. And right now, uh, as we speak, I'm in a film called Super Troopers 2. And I play an angry old Canadian. <laughs> That's about as far as it goes. What happens is the premise is they have to, there's a, a part of Vermont. I don't or think part of Canadians Canada. is being angry. No, that was the whole thing. It was the whole idea. <laughs> They're like so laid back. They don't say was, nothing, yeah. do nothing. They didn't expect that to happen but when they didn't. wound up having a little piece of Canada now in their jurisdiction. <laughs> so they thought so, the Canadians wait, are going to be I'm very easy to get I'm over. Not yet. So how, you mean hmm? the United States and Canada? So part were, of it is... Yeah, there were, they, they found out through, through there was some... Uh, Re, yeah. yeah, they had to re kind of uh, uh, restructure this one part of Canada. And it, it turns out Vermont now has a little more headroom. Oh, so they put these Vermont troopers in charge, <laughs> ex-troopers back and in, into business. And oh. so they are now patrolling the This is like patrolling so the implausible. It is. <laughs> it is. But that's, that's what life's all about, isn't it? So, yes, it is. Yeah. So it's was, like waking up and finding out the gypsies are living in your backyard or something. They're not? <laughs> and why not? I thought they were. So, okay, but, go ahead. So that was, that's the idea. And the movie was shot in Massachusetts. Of course. Uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, they kept delaying releasing the film due to a bunch of different reasons. Probably because the whole idea behind it. No, no. <laughs> no. And thankfully, thankfully, that wasn't the, you know, that wasn't the okay. case. Okay. 
so that's, that's the film. So it, it came out uh, on the 20th of April, and it's been doing pretty good in the bar, you know, box office wise. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow. Super so Troopers 2. That means there's a Super Troopers 1? Yes, there was. Did yeah, you that, make it into Super no, Troopers? No, that came out in 2002. Mm. And it, it, it tanked at the box <laughs> office. As it, they, tanked. it tanked. So the, when. So why would you do it? Yeah, well, what happened that's was, a great it, question. Yeah, what happened wait, was, wait, 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 wait a minute. Why would he's you do been, another? He's yes. been with right. me for years. Yes. This is the first cogent question the guy's <laughs> ever asked on the piano. That's, that's, I didn't think of that. Why, if it first went tank, why well, would you do this? What happened was it, very good. It, became, it became very popular as a DVD. Oh, and as a DVD. As a DVD, it went, oh, as, really? and they call it the second market. It became very popular, oh. and it gained cult status. Oh. oh so the yes. group that's in oh, charge of yes. putting this together, a group, a group called Broken Lizard, which is five guys. They <laughs> Broken have Lizard? Yeah, they've subsequently done uh, other films, and was, uh, they came up with an idea a couple of years ago, and they said, well, you know, the fans have been asking for Super Troopers too. Uh -huh. So they said, well, if you can come up with the money for us, that'd be great. Because they went to the studio, and the studio said, no, the first one tanked. What are you going to do? <laughs> so they said, all right, here's what we'll do. We'll set the bar real low. We'll ask for $2 million from the fans, see what happens. They raised $2 million in 24 hours. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, oh. Yeah. They really so want it. Well, if you got $2 million, why the hell make the movie? Well, you could go to. No, no, no. You can't just, isn't there a country you can go to where they can't? <laughs> Ecuador. You could go to Ecuador. They well, don't extradite you from I, Ecuador. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't go into those details right now, Annie. I, mean, I don't want to give them ideas because no. this movie may never come out. All right. No, well, we're, the, the film's out and it's doing well. And we'll move on now to <laughs> the rest of the show. I, right. we, okay. I didn't come here to talk about no, that. We no, no, I mean, it's you. It's we you, killed you five me minutes. Up on this. Well, you know, I was, I was, all I could serious. go there too, but I I'm was not in going a very to. serious mood. Let's drink up. <laughs> we are here for a serious reason. Yes. yes we are. Some years ago, you don't yeah. live, uh, you live in New Hampshire. I live not in New that Hampshire. Far. Not far from here. Yep. Yeah. And there was an accident and you're with your wife. Right. You love horses. Do you mm -hmm. ride horses too? No, I don't. I don't. What happened was uh, my wife bought me a horse about 10 years ago. Hmm. And as soon as I met the horse, the horse said, you know, I'm retired. I don't give horseback rides anymore. And he decided just not to cooperate at all. No matter how much coaching my wife gave me, or tried to, you know, get the get the horse to, it didn't work. Did, with no, you and the no, horse. no, okay. Did, no. But did she always? Did she have a horse of her own? Oh sure, yeah. So we'd go out for try to go out for trail rides, and what would happen is, she'd say, "All right, follow me in," and then the horse would stop, <laughs> and turn to look at me and say, "No, I'm not. I'm not doing this. I don't do this anymore." And that was it's it. Just retired, right? On the retired, spot. right yes. there. Yeah. Filed the social security papers. The whole deal. Yep. <laughs> that was it. And That's so, it. yeah. So that He's whole thing interested. never happened. The horse was never interested. <laughs> Don't. And so the horse now is working somewhere else. Did your wife grow up with horses? Well, she no, she didn't. She grew up in oh. New York City, but she had oh. a passion for horses when she was about seven or eight years old. Oh. So similar to you, that you had a passion for acting mm -hmm. when you were six, that age, yeah. and yep. then she had a passion mm -hmm. for. Yeah, horses. and she's owned horses for, oh gosh, about 30 years now, mm -hmm. off and on. Okay. And um, on April 29th, 2010, uh, she went out for a horseback ride. We had, we had... Um, Anything unusual about this ride? Or is it no, it was, it was a typical <coughs> ride, and it was, it was, the situation was she was all set, had her helmet on, was, you know, properly dressed. And we had some contractors come in to do work in the kitchen, and I happened to be home. And uh, she left, and about 20 minutes later, the horse came back by itself. Oh, God. Oh, my. And Which, what did, that must, your heart must have Yeah, it did. Uh, oh and, and so one of the contractors who was horse savvy took the horse and kind of put him back in the paddock, and we went up the hill because she... Um, Road in back of the, the property where we live. There's a hill and then there's some uh, trails. Is this, is this a trail that she would do? Oh, over normally. And over oh, again. sure. It was yeah. not a new trail. It wasn't anything right. new. <laughs> what happened was apparently there was a, a, a bear that spooked the horse. And the horse had never seen anything like that, oh, obviously. Yeah. And so the horse spun around and threw her. And wow. she landed face down. Uh -huh. We found her face down. And as we were going into the woods to try to locate her, 
we saw that the hoof marks made by this horse were, the horse was at full gallop because the, the marks in the mud were quite a distance apart. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we found her. We, we followed the hoof prints back into the woods to find her. And retrace the steps. Retrace the steps. Just and like you do with a person's. Right, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we called, uh, I called the police, uh, or called 911 and to try to, you know, get some assistance. And Fish and Game finally came. Mm -hmm. That was their jurisdiction because it's, mm -hmm. everybody has a little piece of property that they oversee. Mm -hmm. And so they put her on a, a backboard and took her out on an S a little four-wheel thing, a little ATV thing out of the woods oh, wow. and brought her wow. to Exeter Hospital mm -hmm. and from Exeter Hospital Did they, they had to put a breathing tube in her at this no time? they was didn't she, breathing she was own? breathing on her own mm -hmm. she was but she couldn't feel her hands or, or yeah. legs she and had, she was conscious she was conscious okay. and she had sustained a, a um, although she did lapse in and out every once in a while did she yeah but the pain was quite extensive and mm. she uh, suffered a spinal cord injury mm. as a result she was brought to a hospital in Boston, and um, helicopter stuff. No, they were going to do that, but it was too windy, so okay. they put her in an ambulance and, you know, a lot longer ride. But a lot longer ride and time is a problem. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So when when they got her there, um, unfortunately, they were backed up with other cases. Oh God, everything that so could go wrong went wrong. Everything oh. that went wrong could. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and God. and it turned out that. <coughs> And the accident happened, and she was transferred out of Exeter probably noontime. And we didn't get in to see anybody at the hospital until later that afternoon. Meantime, you know, time is So you didn't essence. know how she was doing either no. way? No. no, and I was there with her. Oh, my and God. I, I That's drove, like the worst. I oh drove my. down there to figure out, you know, and then we sort of pieced things together. And... Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the case manager doctors came in and, and talked with her about the whole thing and told her that she had sustained a, a spinal bruise, is the way he put it at first, because they really didn't have any, anything concrete. Mm -hmm. But judging by the way that she didn't have any feeling in her feet or legs or hands, uh, they brought in someone uh, within a day or two. She started getting f uh, feeling back mm -hmm. in her hands and in her feet. And they had her start exercising just to kind of get things mm -hmm. in motion. And I had on my Facebook account, I mentioned that, you know, oh, things look great. She'll be home in four days. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that was earlier in the day. Later in the day, we were told by a different doctor that um, she had spondylosis. So it's, it's a degenerative spine problem. It just C th C two through five, I think it was. Well, no, you got to <clears throat> not. I want to make sure I'm clear mm -hmm. on this. So, yep. and we're all clear on this. Yep. This is all injury related, or did she have a precondition? Well, apparently there was a precondition that she didn't know about, mm -hmm. and that's okay. what was discussed when the doctor talked to us, the the, the second person, mm -hmm. and he said, um, "You can go home if you'd like." He said, but if you were to bump against the coffee table and fall to the floor, you would be permanently disabled. Oh, my oh. God. Oh. So he said, here's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. He said, in a few days, because we don't have a surgical team together yet, because this was on a Friday, and they don't do surgeries until Tuesday or Wednesday. So she had to wait this period of time. Oh. And uh, but waiting then, is itself dangerous. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, apparently there were reassurances that there wasn't going to be any further damage. Okay. Uh, so they rebuilt. Um, they crushed the material, the, the, the bone, and rebuilt. So she's, she has a, a stitch, uh, uh, stitches on the back of her neck uh, mm -hmm. from where they did the repair. And she was in the hospital for 18 days. Uh, had some physical therapy the last two days that she was there. Prior to that, they, for whatever reason, didn't engage in any physical therapy. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you so think because she, it was too soon? It could have, yeah, it could have yeah. been too soon. And I yeah. think there was, it was a situation where they didn't know mm -hmm. just how much damage was done. Mm -hmm. and they don't want to do further damage. No. That's They're, correct. No, they want I the don't. physical therapy yeah. to help, not mm -hmm. hurt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
So she went to see a couple of physical therapists here in the area, and she couldn't climb stairs. That was a, a, a big issue. The bedroom's on the second floor of did the they house. Ex did they expect her to climb stairs? Or, or not right away, not no, right away. no, because so it's, it's not a new thing. No, okay. no. So it, it, um, she actually wound up seeing a, a woman, I can't remember the woman's name right now, but the, we went to see a couple of physical therapists, and Karen can be impatient. And she said, they're not doing enough for me right now. Mm. We have to find someone else. So we found a group in the Exeter area. They're kind of a chain. And one of the women that worked there was the coach of the women's hockey team, the UNH women's hockey team, at one point. And this woman sized up the situation immediately when Karen walked into the room mm. and said, this is what you're going to be doing from now on. And with that therapy, okay. she recovered. Right. She has about 95, 98% mobility. There's, mm -hmm. uh, she's left-handed, so there's a problem with her being able to raise her left arm much mm -hmm. higher than this. Mm -hmm. But other than that, she can ride a horse. She's very active. But it was, uh, it was about two years worth of wow. gradual recovery before she felt that she was, you know, are comfortable to, to, to do whatever she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So it was a, about a two-year period mm. uh, before she got back on a horse, got the courage to get back on a horse. Mm. At one point, she, she and I had a discussion. We were going to sell the house because the house has a barn and horses and all that, and just move mm. down the road a, a ways and so just get a regular house. So she's going to give up horses? She's going to give everything up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> But, so, uh, you, so this affected her mentally? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, sure, psychologically. Sure. And then uh, she then said, you know what? I'm going to fight back. This is worth fighting for. Mm. And decided then and there that we weren't going to sell anything. We were going to stay put. <laughs> and that uh, the horses that she had, she had two horses. She sold one, the one that had been spooked. He was not to be trusted afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, in the hands of someone else, it's a totally different situation. Sure. So, um, but she had another horse. That she, she had gotten this other horse like three weeks before the accident. So she had to work with this horse to get this horse kind of acclimated to everything. She hired someone to, to train the horse. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, uh, she got back, back into horseback riding. But it took quite a while. Quite an effort. What does this do to you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it it certainly caused a lot of concern. Did you ever for remember me? ever being as scared of that in your life? I mean, was that not really? I mean, I had had car. I'm I'm a cardiac patient, and I had had an awful lot of things happen prior, mm -hmm. and she and I had been through some things with me. Prior heart to that. attack? No, not a heart attack. I had arrhythmias that were mm -hmm. like through the roof, 186 beats a minute, that mm. kind of stuff. To the point where I was in the emergency room like every three weeks. Oh my. And one day I just kind of looked around, because I meditated at night and I looked around the room and I said, uh, is this it? Mm. Is this it? Is it over with? I mean, am I going to yeah. just keep doing this every three weeks or is it like curtains soon? Walk us through that. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. he, uh, what are the symptoms of arrhythmia? A uh, very rapid heartbeat. About 100. For me, it was 186 beats. Is there sweating or anything? Oh, or? it could be. Yeah. Uh, and you think that, you know. You think you're going to having a heart attack? Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Mm -hmm. And the one mental of, impact mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a possibility of stroke because you're building up blood clots in the process. And is this something you were just born with, or, or do you know how this came Well, this, yeah, this <coughs> came about, you know, gradually when I was yeah. about 14. So you've had these... I've had these situations, but I've since learned how to, how to cope with that. Mm -hmm. So, there, you know, we had a lot of health things in our life. Mm -hmm. So how Before did... Before we go back to her, go ahead, Karen. How did you cope? Really, with, with all this? With Karen's situation? With, with your situation? With my situation? situation what happened? Uh, well, yeah. uh, with Karen, with my situation, yeah. it was a completely different thing. I had mm -hmm. uh, kind of an awakening, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had had this yeah. series of sure. problems, uh -huh. and one night I just said, Is this it? Is it over? You know, am I stuck here? Mm -hmm. And I, that night I had a dream where I was uh, on a bus, went to a bus station. And 
uh, they said, uh, take door number 17. And I went to door number 17 and opened it, and there was nothing there. It was complete darkness. There was absolutely nothing there. Oh. So I said, okay, so this is different. Oh. The next night I had a similar dream where I was supposed to go to a destination. There was nothing there. So I thought for a moment, all right, then that means I'm still around. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to be here. Mm -hmm. I gotta stop you there. You mm -hmm. wanna go to the midway point and, and show a segment. It's going to be uh, Dr. Ferrara talking about tapping. Now that's, you wonder, you, you wonder what that's about. You'll have to see it. This is that's very amazing. unusual. We've had a lot of uh, segments, health segments for I didn't know that. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, this is one of them. And I'm, I'm gonna be learning it right along with you. And so we all will be. Go ahead, guys. Hello, I am Dr. Scott Ferrer from Natural Kill Wellness Center in Elliott, Maine. I am a chiropractor, acupuncturist, nutritionist, and holistic healer. Today's topic, I want to talk to you about alkaline diets. They've become very popular now, and um, they've been brought to the forefront by stars such as Jennifer Aniston. And the reason why that's become so popular is that um, to understand your body's pH level, uh, pH stands for potential hydrogen. A neutral pH balance is about a 7.0. Anything above a 7.0 is considered alkaline. Anything below 7.0 is considered acidic. Well, why is that important for us in our everyday life? Well, in our body, um, if our body is more alkaline, we have the ability to fight disease much more um, uh, forcefully. If we're more acidic, then we have the ability to actually have more disease in our body. So, for example, uh, microorganisms such as funguses, bacteria, viruses, parasites, they thrive in an acidic environment. So anything below a 7.0, specifically like a 6.5 or a 6.0, they're going to thrive in that environment. And if they thrive, they start to break down our cells. Now, here's an important factor. Our cells need to absorb oxygen in order for, for us to actually survive and also to regenerate any uh, cells that have been uh, damaged. So if they're not been uh, healed, then you're going to create something called free radicals. And these free radicals are what cause a lot of problems with heart disease. They can also cause problems with autoimmune disease. And if left unchecked, it can actually cause something like cancer. So we don't really want to have an acidic environment in our uh, system if we can help it. A normal pH for a human being in their blood is between 7.35 and a 7.45. So we want to maintain that level in our blood. However, uh, in our urine and saliva, and saliva um, we would like to actually have our pH to be above that, closer to an 8 if we're able to. So we can use things like uh, pH tests, the little strip tests that you can actually get at your local pharmacy to test your saliva and to test your urine to see what it is your pH is. Now, let's go back to the cells for, for, for a second. If your cells are not actually produ um, absorbing oxygen and not regenerating, then they actually start to break down. The more you break down, the more disease actually has the ability to proliferate into your system. So a cell that actually is more alkaline in our body can actually hold 20% more oxygen in our system than a cell that's more acidic. When a cell is acidic, it actually starts to uh, become oxygen deprived and by the breakdown, it actually starts to take in other things such as viruses and bacteria and then our body actually starts to break down even more so and then that's where disease can actually start to come forward. So we look at the body and kind of go, okay, so how can I change my environment so that I'm making it more alkaline? And what foods can I take in that are more alkaline? Well, there are seven major foods that are actually fantastic, and there's more to that, and I'll give you the resources at the end of this talk. But the seven most common alkaline foods are kale, lettuce, celery, cucumbers, avocado, and peppers. I believe that's all seven. And, um, and the reason why all seven of those work really well is because they all have chlorophyll. Chlorophyll actually helps our body bring in more oxygen into the system and start to raise our pH balance. 
So when we're looking at uh, taking care of ourselves and living a holistic lifestyle, a well lifestyle, we want to do the most we possibly can in order to make ourselves more alkaline, to make ourselves more happy, to bring more oxygen into our body, and for us to be able to heal to the best of our ability. So in our environment, we constantly have things that are bombarding us. So the thing that we have to take control over is the foods that we eat. And if we can, also change the environment in which our houses are in to make sure that our air is purified, our it's clean, and that we're bringing things that are more oxygen rich into our environment. Because as we all know in our society, we know a lot of people who have autoimmune disease, who have cancers, their bodies have been left unchecked, they're more acidic in their own personal environment, and these are the steps that we can take to live our life that we can be free of these types of diseases and have the ability to take control so the alkaline diet helps you take control. Some great websites for you to actually take a look at to learn more about the acid alkaline diet is uh, drmarcola.org. He actually has some great tools for al alkaline types of foods. It's also the alkalinediet.org great resource for you to look into about how you can actually start to change your diet and to actually make it more alkaline. Um, yeah, you also talk about the strips that you can actually use, how to actually use them, and ways that you can actually start to shift your day-to-day. -day. Another great resource for you is David Wolf. Um, he's an organic uh, farmer. He's also a raw foodist, and his uh, website is davidwolf.org. He also has some great resources for you to learn a little about bit this. more about mm -hmm. alkalinity and the, ba the basis for having a true healthy lifestyle. Okay. I hope this conversation and talk was helpful for you. And um, I look forward to um, uh, giving you guys more talks in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to take a moment and uh, talk about this because uh, I used to be 450 pounds and I joined a food program and I didn't know it at the time but what they were putting me on was an alkaline food plan and uh, Dr. Scott is uh, somebody I've known for years and I see him regularly and uh, and when he explained the, di the food plan I was on because I, it was a big mystery to me not only did I lose 250 pounds in a couple of years but in eight years, I haven't had a cold. I know this sounds preposterous, but I haven't. Sometimes I think I'm going to get one, and it goes away, it sniffles. Previously, when I was that weight, I would go right to bronchitis. I didn't get colds. I got colds that turned into bronchitis, and I was out for a week or two weeks. It was brutal. And uh, so when he, when he said he was going to do a spot on alkaline foods plus, uh, versus al uh, acidic foods, uh, it was like, you know, a shock. Oh my God, now I know why I'm going to be 71 July and I don't think I've ever felt this good or healthy. Um, you know, uh, as I understand it, the reason is an alkaline system, disease can't grow. So whatever you got out there, it's going to help you. I actually... You can go to the website and print out an alkaline food list and, and an acidic food list. And, uh, and, and it's very easy to follow. And uh, so I, I, if I ever told you anything that you listen to on this show, most of it is BS, but you know, I can't help that. I was born with that. But uh, please listen to this segment of this alkaline foods as opposed to acidic foods. Amazing. So where were we? We were back. Uh, with Paul trying to cope. Yeah, with oh, you yeah. trying yes. to cope. <laughs> well, uh, I, had, I had had this, this my own health scare. Mm -hmm. Arrhythmia. And, arrhythmia. Yeah. And uh, the possibility of getting, you know, having a stroke. I, mm -hmm. I subsequently had an operation where they removed uh, what they call the aortic sac, which oh. is where the blood clots hang out. Mm -hmm. And they removed it. They went in and snipped it off. And so if I go into an arrhythmic situation, the blood clots can't hide anywhere. Do you know you're having it, though? Oh, yeah, oh you can tell, sure. Oh, what, yeah. does it affect your speech? Or no, no, no. Well, or? Basi basically, you'll, in some cases, if you're really moving, you'll, you'll start moving like this, unfortunately, because it's a kind of 186 beats a minute is pretty yeah. rapid. Um, but anyway, getting back to the story, um, I had 
So I had this, 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 uh, these two dreams that kind yes, of showed do me. Do the dreams again. I, I just refresh our memories okay. about the dreams again. Okay. This is I, important. All right. I had one dream where I had gone to, uh, I was on a bus, gone to the bus station, and I was supposed to take gate number 17 or something. And I got there, and there was nothing there. It was complete blackness. There was nothing whatsoever. So I said, oh, this is interesting. And then the next night, I had a, a similar dream where there was no connection made. So I thought, okay, so if there's no connection being made, then chances are I'm going to be around a lot longer. Mm. There's no destination. So for death, that was the destination. It's like, go from here to there. So it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that said, I th that kind of, that bit of changed enlightenment you. hit me. Yeah. Changed something inside of oh, you. Oh, sure it did. Yeah. And so Do you feel, still feel that change to this day? Oh, yeah. So what I did was I said to whoever I said, whoever I talked to before, I said, if I could just have a little, just a little peek at what it looks like over there, that'd be great. But just not a whole lot, just a little you bit. You don't want to be scared. Just a peek. Just Maybe a, little, a little peek. Yeah. So a like few weeks later. Like flipping channels on a TV. Right. So a few weeks peek. later, I was back in the ER. Oh. And the doctor said, well, we're going to do another operation. We're going to do an ablation, which is they try to correct the electrical path of the heart to mm. kind of, so you don't go into arrhythmia. That's the, mm -hmm. the story. So, here I'm in the operating table, and I go under again, and just before I came out, I saw this garden. Mm -hmm. I saw this incredible, mm -hmm. uh, it was like a, a rose garden, but I couldn't see any roses, and there was a hedgerow further over. And the color was incredible. I'd oh. never seen anything quite like that How before. far back in time are we going here? <laughs> This is 2010. Okay. Uh, no, 2009. I'm sorry, 2009. And so um, I saw that. Yeah. And Was that when I death? came to a near-death experience. Yeah. So when I came to, uh, I called my wife. Yeah. I said, "I'm fine now." I said, "But I had this dream." And Karen uh, does a lot of neurological uh, uh, work. And she said, "Well, when you're under, you don't dream." Mm -hmm. She said, you probably died for a moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And when I hung up, I said, thank you. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, I was working on a film called The Discovery. And I was talking to one of the people. I, was, I played a, a corpse, believe it or not. I can uh, believe that. Yes. You know, I, I've always thought about that. I've always thought <laughs> of you that way. But uh, at any rate, I was talking to somebody about that dream. And I didn't mention to him the hedgerow, because there was a hedgerow wow. further back. And he said, did you go beyond the hedge? Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He said, I was in a, uh, an, an automobile accident. He says, I was clinically dead for a moment. He said, I went through the hedge. He said, on the other side is where people greet you. Oh, my God. He says, that's the wel welcoming line on yes. the other side of the hedge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that. So he, he actually went further than you. He went you. further than I did. Yeah, he went beyond, yeah, and he, he met with a welcoming party, and yeah. they said, well, you have a choice. Either you can stay here or you can go home. And he said, well, I, I love the fact that you get a choice. The, well, he was 25 at the time, he said. Yeah, and and so sure. it was, well, you know, I've got more responsibilities at home right now. <laughs> so if that was possible, yeah. that'd be great. And so he went back. Yeah. So he yeah. lived to tell me the story, so I knew what... <laughs> What that wow. next step was. So you knew what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. So there you what go. Yeah. Tori. But that's that was that anyhow. Yeah. And um, is this gin? I don't always know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just water, right? It's just water, buddy. Because okay. are you surprising yourself that you told that story? No, not necessarily. I've yeah. told that story a number of times. I told it uh, a few weeks back to somebody whose uh, friend's mother was dying, mm -hmm. and needed some kind of. Uh, yeah. Some kind of reassurance. Yeah. Well, so absolutely. she told her the story and it mm -hmm. made things a little easier to accept. The mm -hmm. fact that <clears throat> you had lost uh, your fear of, of mm -hmm. the unknown and mm -hmm. right. death, mm -hmm. how did that, um, did that impact how you thought about Karen? And, and to some degree, yes, because I thought, well, look, if you can get through this, if we can get through this together, if you can, and I know you'll recover. I had every confidence that she would recover because she's very determined. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and you know there was obviously some fear at first. You're going to, you know, you're going to be fearful. Yes. But you know, <laughs> I can't show that because I'm here to give comfort. I can't. Right. Yeah. You know. <laughs> can you speak to this? I mean, oh, yeah. speak a little bit about, about this. Well, How do you handle that from a professional point of view? Well, I, it, it's so common, of course, after any kind of trauma, hmm? um, people are going to be fearful. Um, <clears throat> as you said, your role was to comfort her and not make her more fearful. Right. Okay. So that probably helped her so much. And to hide it, you say, is okay? Yes, absolutely, yes. A lot of people do because their role is a different role, mm -hmm. sure. you know. Um, so when that came out for you, how did you cope with it in your silence? Well, I realized at that mm -hmm. point that, um, that I just, just had to be the, the, the best yeah. person I could be at the yeah, moment. That's you right. Know, you, because you... Yeah. Like anything else, yeah. you yeah. you're working moment to moment. Mm -hmm. You do, and you can't you. project no. further because that doesn't help. You have to, as she says, stay in the day. That's right. So you stay in the day. You mm -hmm. stay in the moment, and you mm -hmm. you work that kind of process. Yeah. You know, it it seems yeah. like it's almost like you both came through as and became better people from this, and maybe the marriage is even better. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You, well, could, you can handle that differently and be the cause of, of irreparable harm to yourself. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's how you handled it is what was way important. Oh, so yeah. If you're listening out yeah. there, you may not be able to take back the accident or what hurt you, but you can affect mm -hmm. the future by how absolutely. you handle it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's, that's something I've always believed. Yeah. And your whole perspective changes. Absolutely. About life. Sure. Oh, oh, what does this oh, mean? Sure. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you had already died on the operating table. Yeah, briefly. And yeah. when I mentioned that to my yeah. cardiologist, he said, yeah. What? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's looking at the records. He said, I can't see anything here. Yeah. I said, Well, obviously yeah. it happened. That's right. But no one yeah. made a note of it because yeah. it was that quick. Right. Because once again, time is something that is mm -hmm. man-made. It's not something that is that is. Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's something that's eternal. It's it's not that's something right. that is man-made. Yeah. We should say it that way. Yeah, yeah. time is infinite. On yeah, the other infinite. side, yeah. Yeah. on the other side, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Karen's back to riding horses. Yep. Uh -huh. Well, did yeah. she have any fear about that? Well, at first, sure. There was some trepidation about you know, how can I do this. And, right. And, but she had some training. Mm -hmm. And she got back on, mm -hmm. and um, I, I wrote a note about what could somebody who likes to ride and likes to ride in the woods, what would be the safety tips that if you did have an accident, what would you do? Mm -hmm. uh, what well, would you do different? What, what do you wish you were prepared for, whether the rider mm -hmm. or you? Well, there, now there are, there are, um, Devices, GPS, like a GPS device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have an accident, you activate the device. But in her case, she couldn't move her hands or her feet. Mm. So what, what would yeah. you do in that case? Exactly. But if, if, for instance, if you were, but you would have maybe riding. found her quickly. Probably. If, if yeah. you go out and you're riding and you had a yeah, oh, GPS oh, absolutely. tracker. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So if yep. anything does happen mm -hmm. where you're not, where That's you don't true. come back, yeah. mm -hmm. well, you know, after a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is this is eight years ago. So I don't a even lot know they had was, those back then. Well, they I did, mean, but it was changes so quickly. Yeah, but it was it was very expensive. Now you have it on your phone. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have a GPS tracker. Well, that's that's something. Well, I mean, you've, you you've mean got a mapping a mapping device on your mm -hmm. phone, and mm -hmm. so do you have to activate it, or is it you always you can get there? that as an app? Okay, for your phone, okay. sure. So I, I have a that. I have a call button that I have that tracks me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. So I can only go to places that don't get me in trouble. Let's just leave it. <laughs> that well, makes sense to me. I have a question about your wife. Sure. Paul. Um, does she approach life differently after the accident than she did before? I think she has. I mean, it I can't sounds speak like for her. she got back to the ability yeah. to yeah, do I, everything that she could yeah. before. Obviously, so. I can't speak for her. And she, she didn't want to come on the show because she just, 
that makes her uncomfortable. And it's dangerous to speak for your wife. Well, well it is. It. Yes, <laughs> so I can't speak for her. But okay. um, yeah, I think her approach to life was quite different. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, well, yeah, I mean, you would know her probably better than anybody. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think her. Yeah, her we'll, we'll allow you to speak for her. <laughs> sure. yeah. What do you her, see as a difference I between think, then and now? I think she's a little more cautious. Mm -hmm. However, yeah. I think. Uh, she also gives herself a, a little more freedom to do right. what she wants to do. Yep. And um, that's living in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. That is living in the moment. Yeah. When so we, she's when more we courageous? Yeah. A little more, yeah. Mm -hmm. But a little more mindful, too, of, uh -huh. of consequences. So mm. don't do this. You started to talk something. about meditation and arrhythmia? Or did I imagine that? I think you imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where's my pill? <laughs> Who has the pill? Is it time for Ronnie's pill? Chad, do you have the pill deal? Yeah. Are they hiding the pills now, Ronnie? They probably are, but it's okay. I've known you long enough. <laughs> I don't know. Are you mean saying this is it with the friendship? This is no, it? no, 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 no. I can't, you know? No. You're going to send me a message later? No. You'll never That's see Paul again. That's the last straw, Ronnie. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, and... and, and I think her outlook on life is a lot different. Mine is yeah. certainly a lot different. Okay. I don't let things bother me as much as they used mm -hmm. to because yeah. why? Exactly. You know, I was talking yeah. with a dear friend of mine yesterday and she's been going through a lot of different things. And I told her, I said, you know, if you start internalizing stuff, you shorten your life. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. So you have to f figure out uh, you give an assessment to everything that, that you encounter and say, is this really worth bothering with? <laughs> it's like people who, who will Change get all... Change their value system. Yes, people yes. who get involved in political stuff. That's, as you know, it's not worth bothering with mm -hmm. because it, it, there's... Things are going to happen the way they're going to happen, so mm -hmm. don't get worked up about it. Mm -hmm. No, you don't need to get into a hate contest. No, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. Why, why even... You have the opportunity, you have the choice to ignore that stuff, just kind of move on to something else. And to move on to something that's a lot more positive. That's what life's about. If you want, if you want to really, you know, really get, in, get into it, zero in on what is positive in your life. That's right. That's, that's right. You know, everything else is not worth dealing with, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. well, it has changed you dramatically. It has changed yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. The trivia in life doesn't mean anything. When you've had an experience like you and your mm -hmm. wife have had, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean a thing. You know, no. it's a more important things, like you said. You know, why get worked up? You yeah. Know? yeah, exactly. Yeah, why wear yourself down? You exactly, know, it's not necessary. Well, you know? this, did you, can you relate to this? Did, did um, you get the well? Yeah, I mean, my story is much different, but and the way Kelly and I dealt with it was, I mean, we're divorced now, but. We still love each other. You but know, your that's state of mind, I want to, can you focus on your state of mind? Or if, do you remember how you used to think about life? Um, it's fairly now. similar to the way I think about it now. I mean, I meditated before my stroke. I mentioned meditation there, right? Um, I mean, I you was look mindful. You a little like I, Paul. I mean, there's a little bit of I mean, it, the way I approach life isn't much different, but mm -hmm. I've had to accept this version of me, which is difficult, you know. Mm. I loved the version of me before. I was doing yeah. exactly what I yeah. thought I should be doing on this planet, mm -hmm. you know, being an architect, mm -hmm. being a husband, being a father, you know, and those things were all important to me. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't do them, you know, so I've had to find other things. So you've had to reinvent yourself. Right, mm -hmm. right. And now I mm -hmm. take more I'll say risks at, of trying things, not that they're risky things, but things that I go in not knowing if I'm going to be able to do it or not, mm -hmm. just because they seem like they might be meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it yeah, um, yeah. you know, and that's a little, and that comes from the stroke and comes from my wife and I, mm -hmm. you know, my wife after my stroke having the breast cancer. And we, we do need to wrap it up, but I, I think what I'm hearing and 
is that you can come through even mm -hmm. really terrible catastrophes mm -hmm. a better person than you were before, a stronger oh, person oh, yeah. than oh, yeah. before. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, anything in life can mm -hmm. do that to you. I mean, this I saw a TED Talk yesterday, yesterday that was not one of the better TED Talks I've seen. Let's just leave it at that. Talking about a blind person who had, you know, special qualities about them. And I think, you know, that's open to anybody. You don't have to have a tragedy in your life. We do have to, uh, you have to end the show and okay. what do we say at the end and, and then talk about Craig. Okay, well, we're going to hear Worth a Minute from Craig Worth, who's a staff member at Krempel Center, a pastor at Nottingham Community Church, and on staff up at Chime, Chaplaincy Institute of Maine, so in a professional musician, and a friend, I guess. And a friend, yeah. <coughs> and we love these spots, so, <laughs> um, yeah, and in, and in fact, if we can see it, I'd love to see the spot, what Craig's doing, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for driving up and Thank doing you. this. Thank and you. I hope yeah. it, uh, hope you, it wasn't too bad, was it? It was okay. No. You know, you'll be all right? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is Worth a Minute. My name is Craig Worth. I was making the rounds visiting folks in a nursing home when someone asked me to say hello to a woman who was in her room just down the hall. She's not going to be with us very long, the nurse told me. I walked up to the numbered room and peeked into the doorless entryway. There was a man and a woman, perhaps in their mid-70s or so, visiting a woman lying in her bed. They were sitting extremely close to the bed. They waved me in and we had introductions all around. Turns out that the man was the son of the woman in the bed. Let's call her Ellie. The visiting woman was Ellie's daughter-in-law. Ellie, I was told, was 104 years old. Ellie smiled at me, told me her name, and did me the honor of offering her remarkably thin and trembling hand for mine to take. Her relatives told me that Ellie's hearing was quite impaired and that I'd have to get quite close to her for her to hear me. They said they were headed to the cafeteria and that it would be great if I would sit with Ellie for a while. I said I'd be glad to. It turned out that I had to kneel beside the bed with my head about two feet away from Ellie's for her to hear me at all. But we managed to start a conversation. We discovered right away that we shared a love for music. Ellie told me that she played the piano in church most of her life, and she sang there as well. She started playing in church services when she was 12 years old. That was 92 years ago. She also told me that she had very kind parents, and that her whole family, her parents and her sister and brother, would gather around their piano on Saturday afternoons. Ellie played and they all sang their favorite songs, including popular hits and hymns from the church services. One Saturday, they noticed three neighborhood kids from another family with their foreheads pressed against the living room window, hands shielding the sides of their heads so they could see in. They looked grim and serious as they watched and listened through the glass. Ellie's father went to the door peeked outside and spoke to the kids. He asked, may I help you? The oldest boy said, we're just listening to the horrible music coming from your house. Ellie said her father looked at them for a moment and then asked another question, one that surprised me. He asked them, would you like to come in? The three did come in. Ellie said they came in almost every Saturday for years, learning and singing the songs along with Ellie and her family. Ellie was smiling broadly when she told me this story. She said she'd forgotten all about it and was so happy to remember. I'm so very glad I had the chance to spend a few minutes with her 
near the very end of her 104-year-old life. To be reminded about the depth of people and about what lies beneath the surface of us. About the great value of patience and kindness and an open heart. See me beautiful, look for the best in me. It's what I really am and all I want to be. It may take some time, it may be hard to find, but see me beautiful. See me beautiful each and every day. Could you take a chance? Could you find a way to see me shining through in everything I do and see me beautiful? Don't Diss My Ability has been made possible through the generous support of Full Circle Community Thrift Store, helping individuals or families living with cancer. Our goal is to help alleviate the stresses of daily financial obligations during this time by providing financial assistance to those in need. Full Circle Community Thrift Store. Living Innovations. Providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include community connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. Natural Care Wellness Center has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine Seacoast for 18 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center, offering gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuroemotional techniques, and massage therapy. And by One Sky Community Services. For over 30 years, One Sky has taken great pride in overcaring for those with developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders. Dedicated to every individual it serves, giving them full comprehensive support and services essential to fulfilling the personal and professional potential and becoming a successful member of their community. Serving 24 Seacoast communities, call 603-436-6111 for further information. And by TMS Architects, New England Design Redefined.